Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining DataCon LA 2020. Welcome to the Data Infrastructure and Security Track. Soon you'll be viewing and listening to Management of Data Communities with Jerry Power and Ryan Kurtzman. I'm Lawrence, your host, and our co-host is Mark, who will be moderating question and answers in chat. So please reach out and ask any questions. Jerry Power is founder of I3 Consortium, a community-driven organization which created an open source IoT governance and marketplace to democratize IoT data networks. He is also founder of I3 Systems, a company created to service and support data networks that span organizational and geographic constraints. Ryan Kurtzen, is an urban planner and community builder. He's currently serving as the Smart Cities Program Manager for the City of Long Beach. Prior to that, he served as Policy Fellow at the Office of LA Mayor Eric Garcetti, coordinating and advocating for equitable access to open space and parks. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Jerry and Ryan. Thank you, Lawrence, and thank you, Mark, for the introductions. Uh, and welcome everyone to Jerry and I's panel on management of data communities. It's uh, great to have you all here. Oops. All right, so Lawrence and Mark already gave a, a brief intro to who we are, um, but before I kick us off, Jerry, did you wanna provide any introductory or welcome remarks? Um, no, I just wanna say um, thank you to um, the people at Datacon. This is, this is a great event um, and we're at a, at a really exciting time in, in sort of how data is evolving and, and we're changing the way we use it. Um, and in some ways, I think COVID actually serves to um, highlight the need and the importance for what we're trying to do. Great. So I'm going to kick us off here and talk a little bit about, um, from the city of Long Beach perspective, what the role of data and government has been, some of the challenges that we faced in the past few years, and then touch on a little bit about where we're heading in the future, um, all with kind of a focus on data sharing um, from my perspective as our smart cities program manager here in Long Beach. So for those that don't know too much about Long Beach, I do wanna just give a quick primer into who we are. Um, so Long Beach is a city located in LA County, of course. Uh, we're about 500,000 residents, so bigger than most people think we are. Um, we also have a very diverse community here in Long Beach um, that we celebrate. We have a, the largest Cambodian population outside of Cambodia. Um, and we also have the Long Beach port, which is the second biggest port in the country following the city of LA. Um, that being said, with COVID-19, like many other cities, we've had a very uh, strained city budget this year. Our, our typical revenue sources of um, port, um, oil, and tourism have all been affected, um, which has made it hard this year. But we're really focusing on efficiencies um, and doing more with less. And that's sort of where data comes into play. So I'm going to touch on some of those um, previous pain points and then also some of our challenges that we have ahead of us here in Long Beach as well. So three of our biggest previous pain points that I want to touch on are internal data sharing, uh, data analysis tools, and community engagement. So first is internal data sharing. So, um, you know, the city began its open data program in, I believe, 2016. We started our open data portal called Data LB, um, which was really focused on sharing data with the public. Um, but we, you know, we hadn't focused as much on was actually sharing data internally um, across departments. And that was soon kind of realized and emerged as a big challenge in Long Beach. Um, but we were quickly able to kind of overcome that. And I want to talk about a couple of the projects that we've done. Um, the first is a project called the Justice Lab. Um, this is something that came out of our innovation team in 2016. Um, and what it was really attempting to do was use data to identify high frequency offenders and people that cycled through our prison and jail system in Long Beach. Um, and use data to identify those people and to provide them with wraparound services and to give them opportunities to 
um, move to you know safe housing, jobs, and things like that. Um, and in order to make that a reality, we needed close coordination between our health department, our police department, and our fire department. Um, and what we were able to do was pass an internal data sharing policy called um, an, you know, administrative regulation, which is what we call internal policies here in Long Beach, which basically set um, and established procedures and policies regarding data sharing for city departments. So this was really a way for us legally to share confidential data, sometimes protected by HIPAA, um, and also police and crime records among those various departments so we could work together as a city to enact the Justice Lab program. Um, and more recently, actually, we've come into an agreement with a company called Open Lattice. Um, and Open Lattice serves as our primary administrative system to facilitate data sharing for the Justice Lab program. So it's not really a data warehouse per se, um, but because our data sharing regulation required so many you know, sign-offs and approvals of, of sharing confidential data, um, we've deployed our open lattice system just to kind of serve as a, a data mark in an administrative way to allow us to share data internally. So we're very proud of that. Um, and we see this use case with the Justice Lab as a way to test it out and see if it'll work for other data sharing projects in Long Beach. So another challenge I wanna to touch on previously is around data analysis tools. Um, you know, as a city, although we did start our open data portal in 2016, we've only more recently started to actually invest in building the capacity of our city staff to um, make, you know, data-driven decisions and to use data analysis tools. So one of the ways we were able to start doing this is by developing actually an open data program um, and developing an interdepartmental data committee. So the photo on the left that you see here is some of our members of our data committee in Long Beach. Um, and we issued our first data challenge back in 2019, kind of like an internal hackathon almost, um, where we got our city staff to partner together across departments and test out all of the data analysis tools that we have in Long Beach. So we have access to Microsoft Power BI, which is a Microsoft-based business uh, intelligence tool. Uh, we obviously have some you know, old standbys like Microsoft Excel. And then we also have some of our staff too that are proficient in more advanced tools like Python or R or Stata. Um, so the data challenge was a great way for our staff to work together and also try out some of the tools that we have at our disposal, really to build our a culture of data informed decision making and a culture of data analysis in Long Beach. Um, and more recently, actually, with COVID-19, we were able to tap into our kind of growing um, skills of data analysis in Long Beach to uh, assemble a team together that put together a bunch of internal and external facing dashboards focused on communicating COVID-19 data out to the public, um, but also internally for our key decision makers at the city. So on the right there is just a, a little sampling of our COVID data dashboard, which we use Power BI to run. Um, and it's all automated. We pull from various data sources, including the state's health data and hospital data, um, our own health department's data, as well as a couple other data sources as well. And then the last pain point I want to touch on previously is around community engagement. So the promise of open data in 2016 was really all about posting data publicly so we could A, be more transparent um, and be open and honest with what we were sharing, but also to engage the community in Long Beach around data, to get them to download data, to come up with fun apps and uses of data and so on and so forth. Um, that's definitely been a challenge for us in Long Beach, I think for a few different reasons, um, but we've been able to start kind of working and chipping away at that in a couple different ways that I want to touch on. Um, the first is through a program that we call tactical data engagement. Um, and one example when we deployed this is actually with our homelessness data here in Long Beach. So every year we do something called a point in time count, which is where we gather volunteers together to go out and actually physically count how many people experiencing homelessness there are in Long Beach. Um, however, we don't, really don't do much with that data. We have it posted online in a PDF format, um, and it's not super accessible. So we deployed something called tactical data engagement, um, where we got different stakeholders together. So we got service providers, we got even people experiencing homelessness, we have Long Beach residents, and we started coming up with different personas about who would actually use open data and for what reasons. 
Um, so for example, you might have a resident who's interested in learning about homelessness data um, and how they can start referring homeless folks to services. Um, and then on the other hand, you might have you know, someone who works as a healthcare administrator for a homeless shelter and they want to share data with different agencies cross jurisdictionally. So using all of this engagement and outreach that we did, we actually did a survey as well with about 300 responses. We were able to come up with some recommendations and strategies to design a open data portal or website focused on homelessness that really kept the user in mind, which we're really um, excited to enact soon. I also wanna to touch on our Office of Equity. So Long Beach developed an Office of Equity a couple of years ago, um, really focused on advancing racial equity for city policies and also improving outcomes for everyone in Long Beach. So um, we really bring that lens into our data work as well. Um, and we've been trying very hard to uh, make sure that we're disaggregating all of our data by race and ethnicity, and then posting that on our open data portal as well. And then more recently, we've developed something in Long Beach called the Smart City Initiative, which I'm proud to lead for our city. Um, and what we're contemplating doing is actually developing a model where we can allow communities themselves to solicit ideas and submit ideas, which we can then pilot um, and test and see how they work. And then if we choose to kind of advance to an implementation stage, we can do that. Um, I'm really excited about that because I think traditionally from a smart cities perspective, um, it's often driven by the private sector, typically approaching a city with a concept or a pitch. Um, and then the cities are kind of working on the back foot to involve the community members in that. Uh, we're hopeful that with this model that we'll be able to actually center community voices and learn from them what they need and what isn't working. Um, and then, you know, if it's successful, we can coordinate on implementation. So I'm excited about deploying that in Long Beach as well. So those last couple slides were really focused on kind of some of the challenges that we've had in the past and some of the things that we've started to do to overcome that. Um, before I hand it off to Jerry, though, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work um, and some of the challenges that we have ahead that I think are important for cities like Long Beach, as well as some of the other cities in the LA County area and probably um, nationally as well. So the first challenge I want to talk about is all around kind of on demand access to data. So, you know, I think it's one thing to have an open data portal, um, but it's really another thing to actually for city staff to be able to access data all the time. Um, you know, we've, we work closely with our city attorney's office to think about how we can integrate clauses and language into our city contracts that give us really access to vendors data anytime we want. So even if we don't necessarily have the data analysis skills or capacity in-house to do anything with it, we at least have access to it. And we're starting to think about data as a utility um, data as an asset and not really just data as kind of like a byproduct of projects that we've done in the past. Um, so it's really important for us to think about data more as an asset and how we can access it on a continuous on-demand basis. So the city right now is exploring implementation of a data warehouse, which would sort of give us this, this system and means of understanding what data exists citywide and how we can access it. Um, then we're also very invested in partnerships as well with other jurisdictions, um, and uh, other agencies to develop data sharing agreements and give us access to data that they might have. Because, you know, while, while cities are solving problems focused on our own residents, you know, we don't exist in a vacuum. We live in a, and exist in a county with 88 cities. There's a lot of problems and issues that are cross jurisdictional and move across boundaries, everything from homelessness to, you know, preparation for the 2028 Olympics. Um, so it's important for us to enter into partnerships so we can um, access data from our partners as well. So I3 Systems is one of those partnerships that we're a part of. Um, it's a coalition that Jerry's gonna talk more about that we're really excited about pursuing um, in the next few years and beyond. The second upcoming challenge that I wanna touch on is, uh, is around staff capacity to perform data analysis. Um, and I've talked about this in the past. It's really, we're working very hard in Long Beach to develop a culture of data informed decision-making and that starts internally with our staff. Um, so we're building up more and more folks that are have an experience or have skills in data analysis work, which is great. Um, and it's you know it's one thing to have the tools like Power BI and Python and R, but it's another thing to have the internal capacity to actually use those tools and to make data informed decisions. Um, so we've started to make some headway into this. So like I said, we've hired data scientists, um, we've trained staff and interested community members, and you know. Uh, software like Python and R and stuff like that. 
Um, but we've also invested in partnerships once again as a way to build our own capacity in the city. Um, one example I want to give of that is of our recent racial equity and reconciliation initiative. So following the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, um, the city of Long Beach and our council members started a process called the Framework for Racial Reconciliation, which is focused on um, making sure that everyone in Long Beach, regardless of your race or ethnicity, have access to equal opportunities uh, towards uh, you know, economic outcomes and basically a chance to thrive. Um, so we did a lot of community outreach for that, all virtually, of course, because of COVID. Um, and we gathered a ton of qualitative data through Zoom transcripts, through Zoom chats, through surveys. Um, and what we did, we actually partnered with Cal State Long Beach, our local university here, and they were able to perform some of the qualitative data analysis for us, which was immensely helpful um, and was a good support for the city in that time. So partnerships, again, are vital, as well as investing in skills like data science and data analysis in-house. And then the last thing I want to touch on before I turn it over is around digital equity. So I spoke a bit about how community engagement around data has been a challenge in the past. I sort of see digital equity as the next step. So we're defining digital equity as when everyone has access and use of digital literacy training, the internet, and technology devices to be successful in society, democracy, and the economy, regardless of your background or identity. So in Long Beach, we're really taking uh, these principles of equity and digital equity to heart when we're designing our smart city initiative. And as we think about data um, moving, moving forward after today. Um, so this is just a, a fun little um, image of a recent uh, community engagement forum that we did via Zoom. Um, and you know, everyone's wearing masks, everyone's in the same room. It's kind of a, like many cities, we've been forced to transition to doing things virtually. Um, but this sort of relies on the pretense that everyone has access to devices and technology and even the internet. So when we think about digital equity and access to data, it's important to think about things like data privacy and digital inclusion um, and digital services. I mean, with City Hall being, um, you know, closed on Fridays now and also just because, you know, it's harder to come in person, we more and more have to invest in providing services digitally so people can, you know, pull their permit online or pay their utility bill without having to come into City Hall. And then finally on the digital equity front is the conversation about privacy and transparency, which I think is really important to all of these conversations that we're having um, at this whole conference about data. Um, so when we were engaging our community around smart cities, we asked them specifically about their thoughts on privacy and transparency and education. So on the screen now, you see a couple of slides and quotes um, of what some of our residents said. So, you know, you can see in blue that some of our residents have concerns about sharing data with law enforcement or with ICE. Obviously, that's a very sensitive topic for people that are undocumented or uh, facing deportation. Um, other residents think the city needs to be very, very careful with how we collect and share personal information. So I'm working very closely with our city's Technology and Innovation Commission to develop some data privacy guidelines that really dictate um, what our key goals and values are when it comes to sharing data and even collecting data about residents. Things like we will never sell data to third parties or we will only use data for what we explicitly intend to use it for, um, or you know, we will be transparent and accountable. So. We're finalizing those now and we see those as sort of our, our core values as we begin implementation of smart city projects um, and probably collecting more and more resident data in the future. So uh, I'll turn it over to Jerry now. Okay. Can you see me okay? It's good? Slides. Screen shared. Up, oh, yep, a little too far. So here's so here's what we're, I want to start a little bit by talking about what is a smart community. Um, I don't think there's a really solid definition of what is a smart city or what is a smart community, um, but I think that it's important to sort of say exactly what that is. Um, it's not when we think about what a smart community is. 
it's it's these are things there are things a, a community a city might do to as evidence of being smart as being things that fall out from being smart but they don't make the city smart there are smart projects um, there's digitization there's use of automation these are all things that a smart city would do but when you start thinking about uh, what is a smart city a smart community it's committed it's a commitment to a plan that's going to use technology to make services efficient and effective across an entire community. Um, if you're doing that in a really smart way, it means that you're building on prior successes. So every step down that road is you get closer and closer to where you want to be, but you never really ultimately get to your long term vision. You're taking steps. It's a journey along a path. The, the other thing that we think consciously about as we're doing this is what is, is we use the word community instead of city. Um, when you say a smart city, it often kind of is interpreted as mean things that are internal to the city. Um, but in the previous session and, and in Ryan's comments, he was very clear about, about how do we share the data with community, whether that's residents, businesses, how do we share with neighboring cities, but it's also how do we use the data that these other entities are generating to sort of make the community bigger than just the city itself. Um, so that's sort of important to think about. And, and when you start adopting that bigger definition of what is a smart community, it actually begins to change the way you think about things. Um, uh, Ryan mentioned talking about using data as an asset and, and managing data as it's a utility. That's an important thing to think about because what it means is that in, in a finance world, when you think about an asset, you increase the value of the asset by leveraging it, by using a single financial asset and using it lots of different ways. That drives the value up. We wanna do the same thing with data where we're not thinking about data as a consumable that's used by a specific project. And once that project is done, you go on to the next project. It's how do we make data so that it's usable by lots of different projects. So every time we build a project, we sort of have made the next step to the next project an easier step. Um, and, and that's an important thing to think about because it causes you to start thinking about data as a part of the infrastructure, um, which is a different thing completely. Um, it is complicated. It steps away from data silos. Um, but this is an important step to understand and it changes the way you think about some of these projects. Um, right now, a lot of what's being done in terms of how do we apply technology is it's up, the historic ways. Look, I'll give you my data if you give me access to your app. And it's almost done if you think about it in economic terms like barter um, more than anything. Whereas what we're trying to do is a much more managed data economy where we create the data, it's an asset, and now we try and leverage it outside. And of course, when you have thinking about data as, as an economy, you start thinking about what things do I need to do to make sure I maintain the integrity of that asset. And that's where we get into ideas, talking about privacy and security and all the other transparency, which comes up often. And these are like critical factors as you make that transition. Trust is another important uh, example of what that means. So it really changes the way you think about what you do. Now, what I3 Systems is doing is we're building a very thin layer of software that sort of inserts itself between those silo structures where data feeds um, into an app and the app sort of looks at the data as a consumable that it allows it to do its thing. Where we put I3 Systems in the middle, you think about it now, right now the role of the purpose of I3 is how do we maximize leverage? How do we maintain control? How do we start shifting our thinking so that we start thinking about data as, as infrastructure? And that's really the, the position that I3 is, is, is trying to move toward. Um, we, we developed um, I3 and it's really fundamentally changing the way that in LA we're thinking about the way we use data. Um, one of the, the projects we're working on is this idea of intelligent video systems. Um, and there's actually lots of cameras um, in Long Beach. Uh, they're all over the place, um, but they're typically used to sort of support a specific function. 
Um, and when you do that, they become sort of a departmental asset. I mean, is this part of the traffic management system? Is it part of the sanitation system? Um, but if you think about video, by applying different kinds of data analytics to the video, that same video stream can drive lots of information out of it. And you can change that video system that the cities initially deployed to becoming sort of an asset for the entire city, an asset for the community. Um, an example of that is like if you put video on sanitation and bus trucks and, and you can actually as you're driving around the road, you can see where potholes are and measure how big the potholes are getting um, day by day. Um, and if you know the potholes are this one particular pothole is growing at this rate, um, you can sort of start scheduling now your road crews to go out and effectively be much more efficient at how they, they repair the roads and, and do it in a way that is it's actually thinking about the problem before the citizen has sent it into a 311 call or reported, hey, this pothole needs attention. So now you're being much more proactive uh, for the citizens. Uh, but that same video thing, as you're watching, um, going through the streets, you can see if there's something on the side of the road that shouldn't be there and maybe then um, dispatch a crew to take care of it. Or you can notice where there's graffiti or where there's overgrown uh, vegetation. These are all things that can be done to make a city much more proactive and do it in a way by um, so that it's it's not an infrastructure that drives a specific function, but it's, in, it's the infrastructure that drives lots of functionality. Um, so that's really something that's kind of exciting. Another thing that we're doing, uh, we're working on something we call um, uh, a smart parking. Um, if you think about, about parking in LA, parking in LA is, is a perennial problem. Um, maybe less so now that people are driving less, but it's hard to sort of figure out where to do that. The problem is, is that if you think about parking, it's managed not to, there's city, city owned lots, um, they're county owned lot, they're private lots, and every, every different lot really has almost a totally different technology deployed. So how do you take all these different kinds of data from lots of different places, stitch them together to build a composite view of what is the parking situation? Um, and that's one of the projects that we're working on in I3. Um, it's, it's also interesting when you think about it that parking is not a specific problem to Long Beach. Um, it's not a specific problem to the county, to the city, uh, but it's really when people want to go someplace, they want to know parking in a much larger area. People don't that much care about where the city boundaries are. They want to know where parking is. So this is actually an example of an application that spans specific city borders and, and shows how we have to sort of start thinking about technology different if we're really going to provide be uh, benefits to the residents that we're at, which is kind of exciting. Um, one of the problems, and we're probably a little further away from this, is still something that we're thinking about. But if you think about, about the COVID situation and um, the question there, there's a couple things you can think about. One is that when most people think about, about smart health um, or, or healthcare applications, they're typically focused on the doctor patient um, relationship and how do we make those relationships stronger? Or they're focused on um, the hospital and how do we make hospitals more efficient? But if you think about healthcare, it is truly a, a community driven concern. And there's lots of people that are involved um, that go from um, services, NGOs like Meals on Wheels. Um, there are social services in the city and the county which help take care of these people. And, and they all have a concern about, about how do we make the community healthier? But how do you coordinate the data between all these organizations? And we think there's a role for I3 to play in that. Um, and certainly as we look forward, we expect the COVID situation to be something um, that's going to be with us for a while. Um, and we may end up having test centers maybe in every building. They'll test employees as they come into work at the beginning of the week. Um, I know my daughter who's in college, she gets tested for COVID um, once a week. But how do you collect all the data from all the different places where this data can be, come from? consolidate it to get a view of what is health in the entire area, like instead of looking at, at health in just a specific space. 
Another area that we're working on, we're working with the Hollywood Business Improvement District. Um, if you think about um, Hollywood, there's the Walk of Fame and up and down the street, um, a bunch of small stores are there. They're, they're not necessarily mom and pop stores, but they're not, they're not huge stores. Um, when you think about how do we do smart retail, historically, when people are in the store, you can sort of do things and apply technology to learn more and service them better. Um, but if we take the data from all the stores in that area, able to pull it together to sort of say, all right, here's a composite view in real time of the demographics in the city, that's something that has immense value economically to how cities and areas evolve and grow over time. Um, and that's a complicated product, a problem. How do you pull the data from all these different independent data sources together? But that is certainly something that we're working on. Um, so it's interesting. Um, so what does a smart community really look like? Um, it's it real time provides insights to city officials so that they can be more agile managers. That's an important thing. It looks at provides the data that provides predictive analytics so that you're not just being responsive to the current situation, but you actually can anticipate and plan um, and organize your resources to be better in the future. Um, it's, it's about providing data so that your decision making processes are actually driven by data rather than simply gut feel. And how do you improve um, both resident engagement and resident experiences? Um, secondly, uh, or more also, um, the operational efficiencies can be incredibly increased and measured. And it's important to think about it as continuous improvement all these projects, once you start having real-time data, you want to take a step, make a change to your operational processes, your procedures, measure it, and see if it's having impact on the residents. And data is a way to do that. And as, as, as Ryan mentioned in the session before, um, Leah mentioned um, that it's important that privacy security just meets and exceeds expectations. Um, there's, there's too often um, this assumption that we need better laws, and if we meet better laws, um, that that's going to take care of the problem. Um, we try to think beyond that and think the law is sort of the minimum common denominator for privacy and security, and we need to do a better job than that if we're going to earn the trust and participate um, with the community. So that's some of the things that we sort of think about in I3. Um, um, I, I should probably add that I3 is open source. It's available online. Um, there's an open source version of it. I3 Systems has built a much more industrialized and feature enhanced version. Um, so there's lots of activity being done to sort of further push this process along. With that, let me go to to the thank you slide and we'll come up for some a little bit of time. There's not much for question and answers. Do we have any questions online? Thanks, Ryan and Jerry. Uh, great presentations, very informational and valuable. And we appreciate the questions. We have one question. Um, thank you, Jerry and Ryan, for speaking to us. Could you tell us how you got into your respective fields? And could you give us a current example of what a collaborative, collaborative structure in a smart city is? Do you want to start with that one, Ryan? Um, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll go first and then turn it over to you. So let's see. I mean, I, I've always been interested in, in public service and working for local government. Um, and probably what drew me here was pursuing a, a graduate degree in urban planning, um, which really kind of showed me what it was like to really serve the public good and um, really what it means to do authentic and equitable community engagement. Um, so that's sort of how I am here. I've also had an interest and background in data um, and data analysis for a long time. So I'm, I'm, I really enjoy my role working for the city of Long Beach. I think when it comes to a, a truly collaborative smart city, that, that does start with, with your residents um, and making sure that they are kind of front and center in that process. Um, you know, as an example, Jerry gave a lot of great, great options and, and possibilities of what a smart city, you know, implementation could look like anything from a smart parking app to healthcare systems that talk to one another um, to, you know, a business improvement district that's coordinated using security footage cameras and things like that. But, um, and I think those are all great. And I think it's so important that early on in those projects, 
um, that those needs and challenges are, are sourced directly from community members themselves. Um, I, I, you know, I think we talk, often talk about privacy and convenience as kind of a trade-off that, you know, if people want to live in a smart city that might come at the cost of, you know, personal data and personal privacy. And we've seen examples like that in places like Toronto with sidewalk labs and even in cities around here like San Diego where they were doing smart, you know, smart sensors on street poles. Um, and what we've learned from those examples is that if, you know, if you don't engage the community early on and, and be open and honest and accountable about the costs on data privacy, that those projects are likely to fail um, as they did in San Diego and Toronto. So to me, I think collaboration is really defined by, um, you know, making sure smart cities are resident centered uh, and also honest and open and transparent. Thanks, Ryan. For, for my part, um, I come out of uh, a 30 plus year history in the telecommunication industry um, where we built products that helped make the internet, help make fiber optic networks reality. Um, so heavy on the communication technology standpoint. Um, from there, I went in, I went to work at USC where I did a lot of time um, doing research into how technology changes the way we think about business, the way we, we deal with markets and customers. One of the projects that we dealt with was we were trying to understand the inhibitors and accelerators around the IoT market. And we came to the conclusion that there were missing pieces to the puzzle that were going to be needed to really allow that IoT technology, that data technology um, to blossom, to, to fulfill what it ultimately could provide. Um, and that led into sort of the creation of the I3 consortium because we realized this wasn't something that USC could do alone. Um, we needed to build a community around it and be thinking about this as a grassroots sort of project. Um, so the, the, the process wasn't straightforward for me of how we got, how I got into this space. Um, but I think it, it sort of felt natural the way that it evolved. Um, as to the question about, about um, collaboration, Brian's answer was really good. Um, I, I, but I'll draw back onto the, the point that um, Ryan mentioned his smart city initiative. And that's sort of a very hyper local, like how do we innovate? How do we change the way we think about things, the way we serve customers, what projects we take on? And, and that, that's an important part of, of being collaborative is, is understanding what you as a, as a city need and where you're going. There are regional efforts like the I3 consortium, um, which, which brings about a, a wide, wider view of people, a wider range and tries to bring people together to solve these problems. Um, if, if, if from Ryan's smart city initiative, it discovers here's, here's a project that we wanna take on, the I3 consortium might actually find, all right, that's a problem, that's an interesting problem, but here's four other cities that are trying to do that same thing or wrestling with that same issue. Let's bring resources from those four cities together um, and maybe the county or whoever and some vendors, maybe just some interested people and let's work on this together so that instead of having the, the region having four or six different answers to the same problem, we've actually made use of the fact um, that we're building on the power of community to help solve these problems. Um, I'll add to that that there's another layer even on top of that. Ryan and I are both involved with the, the NIST Global Cities um, Technology Program. Um, and, that, and that's a way sort of to take the ideas that are coming out of the Los Angeles Basin area, the Southern California region, and then expand on those and share them um, across nationally and even in some cases because there are some international people who work with NIST through this to share those ideas outside of that. Um, so I think to the answer to the second part of the question was about collaboration. You have to sort of start thinking about collaboration of its layers where you build on the layers above and below you um, to sort of start bringing resources together. Excellent, Ryan and Jerry. Thanks very much again for your presentations. Well, we, 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 have, we have a few minutes left. Um, I think there are no other questions. Unfortunately, no, we only had that okay. question. So, so just, so just, I want to talk a little bit and Ryan mentioned this, it was mentioned in the last one, but I think this is something that is, I think, motivating for us 
um, in that the, the Olympics are coming up in 2028. We know that when the Olympics come up, um, it's going to be a regional event with events happening in lots of different cities. And if you look at where people will be staying, it's, it's basically all across the Los Angeles area. We know that 2028, even though it sounds like perhaps a far distance away, um, it's going to be a data driven event. Um, there's going to be IoT all over the place. People are going to be collecting data, trying to manage experiences for people who are in the area. Um, so the things that we're talking about at this conference. Apologies um, for interrupting, actually, Jerry. We have oh, two, two minutes left. All right. I'm just going to say that this is a thing that motivates us because if you think about the data systems we have in place today, um, if we had to set up and do the Olympics, build the data infrastructure for the Olympics, it might take us two years to set that up and configure it. We have an event for two weeks and then it takes another two years for everything to go back to normal. Um, but we're trying to think ahead to sort of say, all right, no, we can't do that. We need to be able to think about the infrastructures and making an evolvable data structure that supports the Olympics, lets us come together, function like we're one unit, but then go back to situation normal. So this is something I know Ryan, Ryan works on, thinks about um, as sort of a use case as a target is something that certainly motivates me um, and the cities, counties um, in the LA area. It's an important thing to think about. Oh, we have you one question popped up. Um, what's the estimated timeline to implement this initiative in Long Beach and the city of LA? And it's from Stella Rodriguez. So, so where we're at with I3 systems, we're, we're in, entering into beta tests with the city of Los Angeles. Um, so the open source version of the software was tested at a, a proof of concept demonstration about a year ago. The software was released about three months after that. Um, what we're doing on I3 systems is building an industrialized version of that. That's in beta test. It'll, the software will probably be commercially released um, the early part of next year. Um, and then after that, we start rolling out projects on top of that. And this is, and this is something I talk to Ryan about frequently. I don't know if you want to say more, Ryan. Just really quickly, I mean, Long Beach is hoping to begin beta testing shortly as well. Um, and we're also thinking hard about how we can get our vendors in terms of that are doing smart city projects for us to actually start using the I3 system architecture as a place to store their data um, at least as a place so we we have it and we can access it if we do want to do something with it um, at the city. So we're, you know, I, I do want to thank Jerry for your, for your leadership with I3 systems and for convening different stakeholders across uh, LA County together. Um, I'm excited to kind of see where this goes. And I, I think it's going to be a really a big game changer, especially for things like the 2020 Olympics that are coming up. You, and anybody who's on this session, you can see Ryan's email on the screen and myself as well. So feel free to send us messages. Um, we are very much about trying to make this sort of a community driven process. Um, so it's, it's an exciting time for anybody who's at the conference to be dealing with the topics that you're dealing with. Yep, sure is. Thanks, Ryan and Jerry. Uh, please reach out to the speakers if you have any other further questions on the topic. Uh, Thank you for joining today's presentation and I hope you gained some new information insights. Have a great day. Thank you for being a part of this year's DataCon LA 2020. Bye for now. Thanks, Ryan, Jerry, and Mark. This session has ended. Thanks, guys. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jerry. We'll talk soon. Yep. All right. Enjoy your Sunday. <laughs>